Okay, so we'll very quickly go through the basics of machining and now there is lots of videos and books and courses on how to machine so we'll only cover just some minute aspects of it. We don't need to, to do it all here, but a few basic things. First, how to drill a hole. So when you want to drill a hole, uh, usually you have to center punch it to guide the drill but in order to place a center punch accurately, usually you do it by scribing lines, by laying it out and scribing lines. And you can do it with a, any sharp tool, like a scriber. What is important to know is that you don't locate the center punch by looking at the lines, you locate it by feel. Because that's much more accurate than looking. So say if I want to place a hole here, 8 millimeters, say from the edge, and I want to locate it so many millimeters from this edge. Okay. Or I can lay down a ruler and I can use a scriber. Okay. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to place it by looking at the line. I'm just going to slide it until I feel the line. And, and when I come to the crossing of the lines, I feel it locks in place. I actually feel it, it moves a piece with it because it locked in place. And at that place, I, I would press to make a light center mark. And then I would reinforce it with a big center mark, which also means that these punches always have to be very sharp. You sharpen them at about 90 degree tip angle, but they have to be quite sharp so you can feel the line. Okay. So again, you have to feel the previous hole. And again, you feel it gripped. Okay. Now sometimes, if you don't see the lines well for orientation, uh, what you can do is you can take erasable markers and just go over the area. You, this is very convenient because if you go over the area you're working on with an erasable marker, you'll see the lines very well and then you just wipe it off. So. So I'll do the same thing again. So now you can see the lines much better. Same thing, you will feel until it grips the intersection of the lines. One. Two. And then you can just wipe off everything instantly. Okay? So now if you want to drill a very precise hole, you would start with a smaller diameter hole. Okay, it also makes it easier to drill if you have to drill big sizes. You start off with a smaller diameter hole and then enlarge it. So uh, in this case, you can do it by eye, say, or you can do it with a laser finder. Okay. Okay. So now, so, with a small hole, follow it up by the full size hole. Now the reason why you need to drill a small hole first is the drill has a certain web width. And in a bigger drill, the web itself is wider than the center mark. So the center mark cannot guide the drill because the web will straddle it. So, uh, so you have to drill with a small size so it will center itself on the mark. And then you drill with a full size. Okay. And while it's all set up, that's the right time to deburr it with a countersink. Or you can deburr the other side, or if sometimes you can also deburr it with a tool like this, which is made for deburring holes. Okay. If it leaves as big a bear as it left here, it means the tool was the drill wasn't sharp, because the drill shouldn't leave such a big bear. Okay. And 
or, or with the, if you can get to the other side and if it's a big bear, you should use a countersink, of course. Sometimes you have to debear something from the inside, like if you drill a hole inside a pipe or a box and you have to debear the inside where you can't reach in with any debearing tool. So the way you would do it, you would use a tool which looks like a wood chisel, except sharpened at a pretty dull angle, maybe 80 degrees or 90 degrees. And this is a bit rounded, which is also convenient. Now, and the way you would debear it, you would just come inside like this and hit it with a hammer. So say, so it would go like this, or almost parallel to the surface, just at a slight, slight angle. And what it does, it shears off all the bears from the inside. So there are basically three ways to make a hole with a drill press or a milling machine. Uh, one is drilling that I showed you before. One is reaming, which is more accurate. The drilling is the next step. And another one is boring, okay, which is comparable accuracy to reaming, but it's variable size. And it's especially suitable for large holes where it's hard to get such a large reamer. So let's just see the steps. So when you start drilling, if you didn't center punch and so on, it's a good idea that you start with a center drill, because the center drill is very rigid, so it wouldn't pull off. So start with a center drill. And if you want to ream, you use an undersized drill, typically 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeter undersized. Okay. It's always a good idea when you drill and you have electronic readout to zero it. So just in case you bump the handles, if you didn't lock them, you can always come back to zero. So now we'll drill the hole. Okay. Now, if, okay, if this hole has to serve as a bearing, like as for a shaft or so on, drilling doesn't leave an accurate enough a diameter or surface, and you have to ream it. So as I said, I drilled it undersized by about 0.1 or 0.2 millimeter. I can ream it. To get a better finish for reaming, I should put some cutting oil or wax on the reamer. Just a little bit of wax, especially for aluminum, which can stick to the tool. And you do it at low speed. Don't worry about the run out because the reamer is flexible. It will find its own place in the hole. Okay. And now I should get a nice reamed hole, which should be a nice fit, as for example, to a 10 millimeter dowel pin. So, yeah, it's a nice tight fit for a 10 millimeter dowel pin. There's something important I should mention right here. When you try to put in a very precise shaft in a very precise hole, it always locks, it always binds. And this is fundamental. It's not because you did something wrong, uh, because it has to do with fundamental geometry. You can reach a locking condition. And the way to avoid it is you machine a recess in the shaft. You basically leave one millimeter of the full diameter, followed by a groove, which is a few millimeter wide. And then you leave the full diameter again. And the reason for that is if you have a very narrow ring, of the right diameter, you can still tilt it, because you can tilt a narrow ring in a precise hole. So it, it doesn't lock, and by the time it comes down to the second correct diameter, it self-aligns. So that's a very, very important trick, because otherwise, it's, especially if you got a large shaft and a large bearing, if it was exactly accurate, you would spend an hour trying to put it in, it'll always jam. So if you machine this groove, it'll be self-aligning. Okay, so this is a reamed hole, and now if I want to have a special size hole, which I don't have a reamer for, or if I want to have a blind hole, because reamers don't work in blind holes, because reamers are tapered slightly, 
So I have to go through to get the accuracy. So if I wanted to have a step or a blind hole or a big hole, I have to use a boring head. Okay, unlike drilling or reaming, when you do ring, when you boring, the rigidity of the machine is very important because it's a single point cutting action. So there's no balancing force. Like a drill has two lips, so the forces cancel out across the diameter. But here there's only one point, so it will tend to deflect. So that's why I had to raise the table a lot in order to minimize the quill overhang. So when you're boring, everything has to be adjusted to be rigid. So the machine has to be locked. The quill overhead has to be minimized. Everything has to be tight and rigid. And now you have to adjust the diameter. Typically done here. Okay, so let's say we'll open up this hole from 10 millimeter to about 12 millimeter. And you can go a bit faster because it's aluminum. And what's nice about it, that I can machine to a step, I don't have to go through. If I want to go through. And then you can go back and forth once or twice just to take any kind of flexure out of the tool. Okay, and that's it. And this makes a, quite a nice hole suitable for a shaft. Okay. Sometimes you have no choice and you have to mill a housing or a part completely from solid. Like this housing was milled from solid because it had to be completely light tight. So it had to have a labyrinth seal for the light and also had to have precision machined references inside. So it was already to the point, it was just as fast to mill it on a CNC mill from solid. Now, a few things which are very important when you start milling parts on a mill is that first of all, there are two types of milling cutters, ball nose cutters, which have a round nose. There are ball nose cutters and regular cutters. There's also two flute and four flute, but that's less important. Now, the important thing to know is that a ball nose cutter removes metal much faster than this cutter, and also doesn't have a sharp edge, which is prone to breakage. So if you, can de if you don't need sharp corners inside, Always specify round corners, always leave round corners because then you can do it with a ball nose cutter. Now the second thing you should always keep in mind that how fast you can mill and how accurate you can mill has to do with the stiffness of the mill, the how much it can deflect. If it can deflect too much, it can chatter, you cannot take a big feed. Now how much a mill deflects, if you grip it here, the formula for the stiffness is d to the power of 4 divided by l to the power of 3. So it's d to the 4 divided by l to the 3. So if you take, say, a mill like this, and you make it uh, twice in diameter and half the length, the stiffness will be 128 times higher. So it's gross as a seventh power, basically. So basically, you, when you think of it, always think how to design it, that you can use the biggest diameter and the shortest mill. So using the biggest diameter means if you don't need a tight corner here, just leave the biggest radius you can. So all this is designed here for, I think, a half inch mill. Which is the second thing is if you have a housing for milling, always split it in the middle if you can. That's roughly split in the middle. Don't split it at a deep housing and a thin top because a deep housing will need a long mill and if it's twice as deep it will be eight times less stiff and will mill much slower. So try to always design it around these two rules when you design for milling. Otherwise there's really no special tricks in milling and uh, with the uh, CNC machines available you can make uh, very complex and beautiful work but it takes some programming skills and also there's a clamping issue. When you mill, you always have to think, if you want to mill the inside and the outside, you always want to think what is the minimum number of clampings I'll need. Because in theory, if you have a piece like that, you need to clamp it many times to get all the sides, okay? 
but whereby doing things cleverly, you can, for example, if you clamp it one way, you can not only get the inside and the top, you can get these two sides, okay? And then if you clamp it the other way like this, you can get these two sides and the top. So although you're talking about six surfaces, you can do it in two clampings. And if you're really smart, you always think, how can I do it in one clamping? For example, if there is a place here that you don't mind to have two holes, because there's a cover, a decal going over it anyway, so you can put a couple of clamping holes or tooling holes. You can put down screws into T-nuts, into the T-slots, okay? And then you can go around all sides, five sides out of six in one clamping. So always think of tooling holes, okay? So you start off with a blank. You, if, you, if you don't mind having a couple of tooling holes, it helps a lot. Because the clamping is not just an issue, it's a double issue. It's an issue of accuracy, because when you reclamp, you lost all accuracy. Because everything is registered to each other in one clamping. But now when you change the clamping, these features are no longer registered. So it's very hard to maintain accuracy with multiple clampings. And you have to come back to the machine. Because a CNC machine can sit there for hours, do everything, but it cannot reclamp for you. So you have to go back to the machine. So, so this issue of minimizing number of clampings, minimi maximizing mill stiffness, that's the key to good CNC programming.